Hi guys, uh, this is going to be the beginning of the fourth unit which deals with chemical bonding. Uh, so we're going to be building on things we learned in the last unit like looking at like different elements and their arrangement of electrons, in particular uh, their valence electrons, those on the outside. Uh, so now in this unit we're going to learn how these atoms will bond together, um, how they form compounds, you know, like what elements bond with what other elements and in what ratio. So that's basically uh, what we're focusing on this unit. So naming chemical compounds, writing formulas. Uh, so just to revisit again, uh, let's look again at the octet rule. So you guys recall octet deals with that magic number eight. And so atoms want to have a total of eight valence electrons. If they don't have eight, they form bonds with other atoms to achieve that eight. Sometimes atoms will give electrons away. Sometimes they will gain them. Sometimes they share them. And it, you know, it really depends on what type of element they are and their number of valence that kind of determines which they do. So, yeah, that charge will determine if they gain, lose, or share electrons in order to do that. Um, we're going to focus on a couple of different types of chemical bonds. Uh, the first one we're going to look at, and this is the one we're going to spend the most time on, is going to be ionic. Okay, So ionic bonds occur when you have a transfer of electrons. So you have one element that loses electrons, the other one gains them, and then they stick together electrostatically because they have opposite charges. So they are electron transfer, so the gain and loss. Um, these usually are going to occur between a cation and an anion. So basically, uh, you guys remember cations are positive, and if you guys recall, almost all those elements that are positive uh, are metallic elements, things found to the left side of the periodic table. Um, and they will bond with an anion, so those negative ions. And as you guys recall, uh, these uh, anions are generally nonmetals. They're found on the right side of the table. So if you have a compound made up of a metal and a nonmetal, usually it's going to be ionic, something losing electrons, the other thing gaining and sticking together. Uh, they form ionic compounds. Sometimes you'll also hear them referred to. The, the actual term for uh, the base unit of an ionic compound is called a formula unit. Okay. On the other half, uh, we're going to be looking at covalent bonding. So covalent, if you just look at the word covalent, co means together, you know, like co-pilot, co-captain, cohabitate, cooperate, co-worker, whatever. That prefix co means together. They're doing something together. And valent is referring to valence, those outer electrons. So the outer electrons are together. They're shared. Um, covalent compounds are going to be formed between two nonmetals. So two things to the right side of the periodic table, and they're sharing their valence, so two nonmetals. Uh, when they do that, they form what's called a molecule or a molecular compound. Uh, we will talk about covalent later on, uh, but we're going to focus first on ionic. Um, you might be looking at this and you're like, well, you know, I see metals and nonmetals and two nonmetals bonded together. Do two metals ever bond together? The answer is yeah. Yeah, they do. Um, the thing is, though, when you have metals that bond together, they don't really form compounds. They form what are known as alloys. And an alloy is just a mixture of metals. Um, uh, probably the easiest example I can give you of an alloy is like steel. Steel is not just, I mean, it's mostly iron, but it's got other things in there. You know, it can have nickel in there and carbon and other things. So, um we're not going to really focus a lot on metallic bonding. They do, um, but it's it's not it's not our focus. So here are just some general properties of ionic and covalent compounds. Um, ionic compounds they usually form crystals, okay, and so they tend to be hard and brittle. Um, they also tend to be pretty soluble in water. That means they dissolve very easily. Water can get in there and tear those things apart and dissolve them. Um, they tend to be electrolytes. Okay, so I don't know if you've seen that term before or not, but electrolytes means uh, they're something that can conduct an electric current when melted, so when they're in their molten form, or if you put them in water, they conduct an electric current. So those are all things that are properties of uh, ionic compounds. 
uh, whereas things that are covalent, uh, you find them in all states. You know, some are liquid, some are gas, some are solid. Uh, they tend to be more flammable. They, they react more readily with oxygen to release energy in the form of heat and light. Um, their solubility varies in water. Some of them are, are fairly soluble, but some of them aren't soluble at all. They're insoluble. Uh, one thing that they do share in common, though, they tend to be non-electrolytes. That means they're not very conductive. Okay. So what we're going to do now is we're going to look at some uh, examples of these different kinds of compounds, how they formed, and we're going to learn uh, what elements make them up and what ratio and how to name them. Okay, so we're going to start then looking at the basically the main part of this chapter, which deals with nomenclature. Uh, nomenclature is basically just being able to name chemical compounds, write their formulas, stuff like that. Um, I will tell you guys that this is a skill-based chapter, so it's not really something you can sit and memorize. It's basically, it's like uh, we're going to do practice, and there are certain rules, but you have to know how to apply them. And so, you know, there are tens and tens of thousands of different formulas and names of things I can give you. And so you just have to understand kind of how you work these type of problems out. So we're going to start with the easiest type, which are known as binary ionic type 1. Okay, so right away looking at the word binary ionic. Binary implies two. The prefix bi means two. You know, like a, a bicycle has two wheels. You know, if... You see somebody with bifocal glasses, they have two lenses in them, one for seeing things close up, the magnifying things for seeing far away. So binary ionic means two, all right? And so ionic tells you there's a metal and a nonmetal. So a binary ionic type one, these are going to be bonds formed between a metal and a nonmetal, and so there will always be two elements present. How do you know there's two elements present? There's only two capital letters, okay? So um, these are the, the basic rules. They're pretty straightforward. You want to name the metallic cation first. So you find the metal and you just name it. You don't do anything to it. You just name it as is. Uh, then what you're going to do is you're going to use the root name of the non-metallic anion, drop its ending, and add the suffix "-ide", to it. Okay, and that sounds kind of fusing, confusing at first, but I'll show you. And you've heard most of these before. So the non-metallic uh, anion, you take its ending and change it to ide, and that's it. Um, so let's take a look at the periodic table here, and I'm going to zoom in here. Hopefully we can zoom in and see some of these. Okay, so for example, like here we have fluorine. Fluorine would become fluoride. Chlorine would become chloride. Bromine would be bromide. Iodine would be iodide. Go back up here to the top. Oxygen, you would call that oxide. Sulfur would be sulfide. Selenium would be selenide. Nitrogen would be called nitride. Phosphorus, phosphide. Carbon would be carbide. Boron would be boride. If you did hydrogen, which counts because it is non-metallic, you would say hydride. Okay? So those are basically it. It's pretty straightforward. I think it's pretty... Uh, Pretty easy to see. You just take whatever the name is, switch it to IDE. So we're just going to work through a few of these to see kind of how they work. And so we'll start out here basically with this first one. You have sodium and then bonding with chlorine. So you're simply going to name the cation. You don't do anything to it. You're just going to call that thing sodium. My pen's acting up here. Give me a second. Let's try this. Okay, so sodium, and then chlorine becomes chloride, sodium chloride. That's it. Name the cation, name the anion, changing the ending to ide. Easy peasy. Okay, let's try another one. Okay, we have Ki, so K is potassium. And then I is iodide. So you name the cation, name the anion, the end. Okay, let's look at this guy. Ca, if you look it up on the periodic table, it's calcium. And then sulfur, you change the ending to sulfide. Calcium sulfide. Pretty straightforward. Okay, this next one, you look and you're like, ah! You know, what are we going to do with that three? You didn't mention anything about numbers. Well, you know, 
I didn't mention anything about numbers? So they don't count. You don't you don't care what the number is. Okay, you just simply do it just as we have done the other ones. So you're going to name the metal lithium, and then nitrogen becomes nitride. Okay, you might say to yourself, self, well, if that three, if we don't need to mention it, why, do, why is it even there? Can't we just go like this, L-I-N? Isn't that lithium nitride? The answer is no. Okay, let's look at this for a second. I want to investigate a little further and kind of show you why that three is there and why it has to be there. Let's look at these elements on the periodic table. Okay, so here is lithium right here. You'll notice that it has a one negative charge, or excuse me, a one positive charge. And we'll talk about why it has that. And then nitrogen over here has a 3 negative. Okay, so we have lithium 1 plus, nitrogen 3 minus. Let's take a look and see if we can further investigate this. Um, first off, you will recall, if I were going to draw lithium and draw a like a Bohr model, here's the nucleus. The first energy level would have two electrons, and then it would have the second energy level. It would only have one, right? It has three electrons total. And you guys realize that it's going to try to kick this one off, right? It wants eight. It's not going to be able to find eight. So when it loses one, it becomes one plus. Okay, let's look at a model of nitrogen. So nitrogen, here's the nucleus, first energy level. It's got two electrons. In the second, one, two, three, four, five. Okay, because if you look at nitrogen on the periodic table, okay, atomic number seven. So it has seven electrons, that first ring had two in it, and then five in the second, so a total of seven. You guys recall that it wants to have eight. However, you know, it's only got five. So since it's closer to eight uh, than it is to, than to give those five away, it's going to try to pick up three more. It's going to try to find three electrons. Okay, And so when it does that, it ends up being three negative when it gains like an electron here, here, and here. Right? Okay, and so basically in looking at this, well, if lithium's willing to give one up, right, nitrogen will gladly take it. Not only that, but he's going to bring a couple of these guys' friends with him. Okay, so you're going to have another lithium atom that loses an electron to here and another one that loses an electron to here. And so they bond in a 3 to 1 ratio. Okay, so there's another way we can look at this. We can write it in this form. So if I have, like, lithium with a 1 plus, and then I write nitrogen with its 3 negative charge here, okay, I'm going to write lithium first, then nitrogen. The numeric portion, this 1, goes down here. So the charge of the cation becomes the subscript of the anion. A 1 is understood, so it's usually not written. I mean, you can, it doesn't make it wrong, but nobody does it. Likewise, we're going to take the charge of the nonmetal, just the numeric portion, the 3, and drop it down here. So lithium nitride's formula is Li3N. Li3 Do you need the 3 there? Yes. Do you mention the name? No. Because this is the only way those two elements combine in a 3 to 1 ratio. Okay. We're going to practice a few more like that. We're going to do some more uh, writing uh, formulas from names. So let's look at aluminum chloride. So let's look at our periodic table. Okay, aluminum's right here. It's th it's three plus, and then what do we say it was with chloride? Let's go. Here's chlorine. It's one minus. Okay, so we know aluminum's always three plus. Chlorine is always one minus. So I'm going to write the the metal first with its charge. Leave a little room. I'm going to put the non-metal in its charge. Then I'm going to write them together. Metal first. Oops, I didn't write the L. Write the metal first, then the non-metal. Where does this 3 go? The 3 goes after the chlorine. The 1 goes after the aluminum. So you, it's just understood. You write it AlCl3. That is aluminum chloride. Okay, cesium bromide. Let's take a look at these. Cesium and bromine. So cesium is down here. Okay, notice it has a 1+. plus. Bromine over here has a 1 minus, so 1 plus and 1 minus. And just so you guys are aware, when they're 1, sometimes you, you'll just see them written like this with just the plus and the minus sign. 
you don't have to put the one that's understood if you see a plus or a minus that means one since they're equal and opposite they cancel cesium bromide is csbr all right let's look at another one magnesium oxide so be very careful magnesium there's a couple of elements magnesium and manganese okay so let's look over here here's magnesium right here this guy, though, is manganese. They are two different elements. So this was magnesium. Magnesium is 2 plus. And then it said oxide. Oxygen is over here. You'll notice this charge is 2 negative. And so what we're going to do, we're going to say, okay, magnesium is 2 plus. Oxygen is 2 minus. So uh, you might say, all right, let's put the 2 here and the 2 here. And that's fine, except when you have numbers like this, that are equal and opposite, or you can factor them out. You know, it's just like in algebra. If you have common factors, you got to reduce them by that factor. Since they're both two, you have to write it like this, MGO. So equal and opposite will cancel or reduce. So you must simplify, you must reduce the lowest whole number ratio. Since they're uh, they're one to one, you write it MGO. All right. Okay, so that's kind of the end of uh, the binary ionic type 1. So uh, there's going to be a worksheet, a packet, if you will. Uh, the first page is just those binary ionic type 1s. I'm going to start with the next part, which is binary ionic type 2. Okay, so if you look at this guy and you see, all right, Fe, well, that's iron. And then Cl, it's chloride, all right? That's iron chloride. Awesome. Okay, let's say I give you a different one. You're like, okay, iron, CLS chlorine, uh, chloride, so iron chloride. Do you see a problem here? Yeah, they have the same name, but they're different things. Hmm, well, there's something afoot. Well, uh, believe it or not, this is the second one. This is called binary ionic type 2. And so what's going to be different, this is a cation that is a transition metal. That means it's one of those things that are in the middle. Okay. Um, these transition metals, uh, they have various charges. So those metals have various charges, multiple charges they can be, all right? So binary ionic type 2. Um, I'll just show you. We'll take a look real quick. But if you look here in the middle, like example, we just talked about manganese. It can be 2, 3, 4, 6, or 7 plus. Iron is 2, 3, or 6. Cobalt is 2 or 3. Most of them has multiple charges. There are some, like zinc and silver, that only have one charge. If they have one charge, you do it just the way we had been doing the binary ionic type 1. But we're going to focus now on some of these here in the middle that have multiple charges, many types of charges on them. Um, and so here I noted a few, like silver, zinc, cadmium, they're representative, and aluminum and indium, there are some other ones, but those are the main ones. So the ones in the, in the transition block, that middle section, um, if they have more than one charge, you have to indicate it. If they don't, just ignore it, just like the type we just did. Okay? So let's take a look here. Uh, because I said, you know, those transition metals have variable charges, you have to indicate them in the, in the formula name. And so they're going to be represented by a Roman numeral. And so you want to make certain you jot down these Roman numerals. And honestly, you don't need eight. One through seven you need, though. Okay? So 1 is I, 2 is I, I, 3 is I, I, I. Uh, notice, guys, 4 is not 4 I's. It is IV. And I know you're saying, oh, I've got a clock at home that has Roman numerals on the face. The number 4 is 4 I's. Yeah, some clocks are wrong. Okay, It's just, I don't know, tradition. I guess that people make clocks that way. But if you look up the Roman numeral 4, it is not 4 I's. It is IV. Uh, and anyway, then 5 is V, uh, 6 is VI, 7 is VII. If you know those those uh, 7, you're set, you're solid. Okay. And so anyway, we're going to use those Roman numerals that tell us 
what the charge of the atom is. Okay, and I'll demonstrate how some of these work, and then you guys are going to have some time to do some practice. Okay, so let's look at this first one, CuCl. Okay, if I look at this up, you might at first say, oh, that is copper chloride. Okay, it is not copper chloride. Okay, because if you look at copper, there are multiple charges of copper. It's either copper 1 or it's copper 2. And so we need to look at copper, we need to look at chlorine, and we need to determine what its charge is. Well, how do we do it? Well, it's basically the reverse of what we were just doing. Remember how we were just taking charges and crossing them? Well, now we're just going to take these formulas and unzip them. And so what I do is I look and see what number is here. So if there's no number, it's an understood 1. It's not a 0. If it's 0, you've got like 116 other elements you need to list that aren't in this compound. Right? So there's a 1 here. This 1 goes up to the chlorine. Look behind the chlorine. There's a 1 that goes up to the copper. Okay. Now, there, there's a second step to this. So, not only do you have to unzip it, but then you have to look at the charge of the nonmetal and verify that it jives with what it should be. So, I reference my table, and I see chlorine is 1 minus. That means I don't have to mess with it, and so I can just leave it that this is uh, 1 plus. And so, when I name this, it becomes copper Roman numeral 1 chloride. Okay, that one does not tell me there's one copper. That one does not tell me that there's one chlorine. The only thing that one tells me is this, the charge of the metal. Okay, all right, next. Let's look at this guy, Fe2O3. So once again, I'm going to take this iron, because if I look at iron, it's either 2, 3, or 6, right? So I need to unzip this to figure out what its charge is. I'm going to put oxygen here. This 2 goes over to oxygen. This 3 goes over to iron. Is oxygen 2 minus? Well, let's look at our table. Here's oxygen 2 minus. That means I don't have to manipulate it. This is called iron, Roman numeral 3, and then oxygen becomes oxide, iron 3 oxide. Once again, this 3 meaning this 3, right? The charge of the iron. All right, let's look at another one, FeO. So once again, we're going to unzip this guy, Fe. We're going to put O here. Okay, if you look at the number, there's a 1 that goes up here. There's a 1 that goes up here. And you might say, okay, that's iron 1 oxide. It is not. Okay, you might be, oh, well, I don't know. It looks like there's one of each there. Yeah, but let's look at our table. Iron doesn't have a 1 form. It's either plus 3, plus 2, or plus 6. So how do we know which one it is? Well, remember when I said we always had to verify the charge of the nonmetal? If you look at oxygen, oops, let's go over here. If you look at oxygen, oxygen's charge isn't 1. It's 2. It's fixed. It's always a 2 minus. So what we need to do is, okay, we came up with this being 1, so we have to double it. So if you double 1, you double the other one. This is actually iron 2 oxide. Okay, so once again, by looking at this, notice there isn't two irons or two oxygen. That two is the charge, right? And if you think about this in the opposite way, if I give you the name iron two oxide, if you know iron is two plus and you know oxygen is two minus equal and opposite, they reduced FeO, that is iron two oxide. We'll do a couple more, and then uh, we're going to set you loose and have you guys do some practice. Let's look at this next one, tin 2 fluoride. Okay, so tin, this Roman numeral 2 tells me it's charge. That doesn't mean there's two tins. It means that it's 2 plus. I look up fluorine. Fluorine's right here. It's 1 negative. So fluorine is 1 negative. So I'm going to put tin first, then fluorine. This number 2 comes down here. This number 1 goes there, so it's SNF2. You know, some people get their feelings hurt or something. They're like, why don't I put like 1 minus? What you guys have to understand, those positive and negatives, they're only tracking where the electrons are coming from and where, where they're going to. Okay, It's showing that tin is losing electrons, fluorine's picking them up. Um, and it's just really to keep them in order. The positive one, the cation, is listed first. The negative one is listed second. Okay, so you, that, that's the only thing the charges are really doing. Don't don't get your, you know, your pants in the water. Get too upset about it.
Okay. Let's look at this guy, copper two sulfide. So this tells us in this instance, copper is two plus. Sulfur, if you look up sulfur on the table, here's sulfur, two negative. Okay. So equal and opposite, they reduce, C-U-S. That is copper two sulfide. It, it is not the same thing as saying Cu2S2. Okay, that's going to cause us problems in the next unit when we start writing and balancing formula equations. So you have to get the formula correct, and copper two sulfide's formula is as follows. Okay, I think that's probably a pretty good place to stop. Uh, and so what we're going to do is I'm just going to have you practice the first two pages of the uh, nomenclature packet, so binary ionic type 1 and then binary ionic type 2. Uh, so they're both two elements, uh, a metal and a non-metal. The only difference is on the first page, the type 1, all the metals have a fixed charge. They're representative. They only have one charge, so you don't mention it. And on the second page, all of them are transition metals, meaning they have various charges, which means you must put a Roman numeral to indicate what it is. Okay, well, we'll call it good there. Thank you.